Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, I guess you could say that because you're seeing me, and once again, you're, I'm not seeing you. But uh, I thank you for um, showing up this morning and being part of this service. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, that's not said enough sometimes, but uh, we appreciate you uh, being vigilant and being here for Sunday school, and uh, and that that may we may study God's word together. Um, I um. I'm really looking forward to today. We're starting a new uh, uh, session, a new section. It's uh, the first six lessons today are, are going to be uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, I know a lot of you right now are concerned about where's my quarterly. And uh, they have not arrived, but um, I do have the teacher's edition right here. And that's what I will be teaching out of. And so uh, the uh, Brother Brandon and Brother Charles will you know, be doing the same thing like we've been doing every third week. So I'm starting off this new section right here. And the section is called, After God's Own Heart, A Fresh Look at the Ten Commandments. Now, some of you are just going to be saying, oh, my gracious, the Ten Commandments. Why in the world are we doing the Ten Commandments? Well, first of all, I said a fresh look. Uh, one thing that got me when I first saw this right here and I looked in, uh, in, in my quarterly and I uh, I saw that you know that that this was written. This particular lesson was written uh, by uh, Pastor uh, um, uh, Tony Evans, and uh, and that blew me away. Uh, if you've uh, ever watched him preach or heard him preach, he is a man of God. He has a, a huge church, like nine hundred some people, I think it is, uh, in Dallas. He went to uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, and he is the uh, he is the he is the writer uh, uh, of, of this of this lesson right here, and he is um, he's he's really good. Uh, Tony is seventy one years old, and uh, and he is uh, still writing stuff like this and preaching. So, uh, amen and bless him. Um, so, a fresh look uh, at uh, uh, at the Ten Commandments. Uh, why are we uh, why are we uh, looking at the Ten Commandments? Well, I think I. I I'm excited because when I looked last uh, quarter at what was coming the next quarter and I saw these lessons, I uh, saw where we're going to be looking at a fresh look at the Ten Commandments and not only are we going to be breaking the Ten Commandments down, doing the first two today, uh, then we're also going to be looking at David in Psalms and seeing how it blends from those commandments to what David was thinking and saying to God. And so it's beautiful. Uh, well, when we look at when we look at the Ten Commandments and we look at the Old Testament, um, uh, yes, it is historical. We cannot have the Bible be full and complete without starting at the beginning, can we? Of course, we as Christians know that we are safe by the grace of Jesus Christ. And the, the people in the Old Testament, I'm not going to go into all of that, but uh, they were, God took care of his people in the Old Testament. But he sent his son. But his son, we have to keep in mind, was present from the very beginning. Jesus, Jesus, create the earth created for and by him. Okay, Jesus is there at the very beginning. Jesus will be there forever. So, and our Old Testament is full of prophecy of Jesus is coming. Of course. You know, we, all the major prophets, the minor prophets, everyone has prophesied, particularly, I, I particularly like Isaiah, all the things that he prophesied for us to come to Jesus. But uh, David, his writings, he foresaw the coming of Christ. And so uh, scripture tells us, um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, um, Paul tells us very clearly that all scripture is good for interpretation and all of Scripture is profitable for or, for us and for the learning and edification of our lives. So it, I, I, I love the Old Testament. It gives us that foundation that we should have uh, in order to be better Christians. No, we're not bound by the Ten Commandments. But if you are a Christian, you are truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Obeying and doing the Ten Commandments comes automatic. You will do or not do the things that's in the Ten Commandments. Now, I say do or not do. Well, we got a mixture of two. The purpose behind this lesson when they wrote this, the, these, these six lessons, was to give it 
the positive, not the ne- necessarily so much the, the don't do's as the what you should do as a Christian and the, using the Ten Commandments as a guide for that. So when, when we look at the things that we do in this world and where we are, having a fresh look at the Ten Commandments, I feel is a good thing. And I'm going to go ahead and get, get going on, on this. Uh, so we're going to start in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And then we'll go into Psalms uh, 16, uh, 1 through 4, and 9 through 11, if we have time to do so. I, I, I do want to be sensitive to your time, and but these first six are the ones that my major concentration is going to be on. Uh, you know, I love to break down Scripture. We have to break down Scripture. We're, te- this, we're teaching Sunday school. I, am, I would not be doing my job teaching Sunday school if I didn't break down the Scripture. It's just like the pastor on Wednesday night. If he's doing when he's doing Bible study, if he doesn't break down the scripture, you're not studying the Bible. Well, this is the same thing as Bible study, but it's just on Sunday morning is what it amounts to. So uh, the point of today's lesson is God is to have first place in every aspect of life. Now, God brought the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and we know all the events that took place. They, they, and they get to Mount Sinai. God makes his presence known there in a mighty, mighty powerful way. And I mean, the, the clouds in the sky, the mountain itself rumbling, uh, the light and the thunder, the rain, the storming. No man, no man could see God nor go up that mountain when they got there. Things changed a little bit. Okay. And but we all know that Moses went up the mountain, received the Ten Commandments from, uh, from God. And this is here, here's where they are. And it's also, this is going to show us where the people were at that time. So I'm starting on Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. And I will read God's holy word. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have, this, this is number one right here. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We know that. The second, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a what jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So God, and God spake all these words. Let's st- just start with the very basis here. And God spake these words. This is straight out from God himself, the thundering, I'm seeing in my mind the thundering words of God himself saying these words, I, who, who did God say he is? He says, I am that that I am. <laughs> I am the Lord, the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God is God is talking to the people, and he, he is setting the stage right here. He is telling them, you know, he, he is the I am. And he says, the Lord thy God, the Lord, Yahweh. You know, Yahweh was suddenly spelled with, uh, with consonants, consonants uh, to begin with. And, uh, and, and, and people over the years, you know, added the vowels to it to spell Yahweh with six letters like we do now with the, uh, with the A's in it. But Yahweh was four letters like Lord's four letters. So... He says, I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He set them free. He set the Israelites free. And what he's, what God is doing here, he's setting in these two verses, he is setting the stage for the people and telling the people that I want you to fully recognize and realize who you're dealing with. You've got to, it, it's like, when we start a lesson and we, we get the background to it, uh, it's like uh, a speaker gets up to speak that you've never heard speak before. They, they're going to do a little autobiography of themselves. They're going to tell you a little bit about themselves and about what they're going to be talking about before they ever get to it. 
Well, somewhere along the way, the fact that you're there with them, you, you, you've you got, got a feeling that they're going to be saying something that you're interested in. That's why you're there. And so we always have to have a background to everything. Well, God's background was real simple. He's, 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 he's letting them know, I am the God of Genesis. I am the God of creation. I am the God of life. I am the giver, and I am the taker of life. All life comes through me. Some lives will be for eternity. Some lives will end at their time here on earth. But I am the God that has done everything for you. I am the God that has set the standards for you and for the universe. The universe. Why? Because he created the universe. Thou shalt have, it's the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, when we look at that and we, and we break down, thou shalt have no other gods before thee, and people say the Old Testament's not relevant. Oh, my gracious. Look right here. Uh, right now, do people have other gods before them? Uh, people are taking earthly things. People always have. They started right here. They started having you know, right there. And nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed as far as people having other gods before them from the time God said this to the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai, the only thing that has changed that there's more toys and bigger toys, and that, that's it. They People have the same sinful nature and still have the same way of going to things that they should not and worshiping them. But the thing that it says in the scripture here, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's not implying you can have other gods behind me. That's not what God is saying. God is saying me and only me. Before me means really to my face. In my face is what God is saying. I don't want to look at you or anything that you have that is being placed in front of me. It's me. I am your God and only me. Hey, and then people say, well, wow, really? So that sounds like God saying that, you know, well, since I made you and I made the universe and I made the earth and I made the food that you eat and the, the house that you're in, the clothes you wear, everything that you have in this world, not to mention the promise through his son Jesus Christ of eternal life, that, that's like God is telling me what to do. He is. He's telling us, I created you in my likeness for me. And I want you to obey me because only I know what is best for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God truly does know what is best for you better than you do yourself? Does he know be what's best for you better than your friends that tells you what you should be doing and you aimlessly and following them? Is is the, who, who's, who's the better one here? Who, who are you really going to believe in life? I mean, that, that's why we walk down two paths. Do, do we do what God says because he has proven to us right here Right here, he has proven to us in his holy word and in everything around us that we should obey him because if we obey him, we will have eternal life. We will do the things that are supposed to be done. So he's telling us that not because he says that it's just because I am who I am. I mean, he's not, he's not doing it that way. He is doing that, but it's not in a bad way at all it's in a way it's in a loving way and we'll talk about that a little more but it's that that is god trying to get their attention and certainly everything that's in the bible that is profitable for us everything that is said to the israelites everything that is said to the gentiles everything that is said to the uh, all hebrews all gentiles all romans all greeks all Canaanites, uh, all Philistines, uh, all Ammonites, uh, everybody in there, everything that's been said to them throughout the history, it's been for their own good, for everyone, everyone to have a pathway to heaven. Thou shalt not, okay, thou shalt not make any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Now, when he talks about the graven images, uh, we really need to look at the graven images because that that's not saying that we cannot do things. We can't uh, have like picture for artistic uh, interpretations. Okay, uh, we we do that. Uh, we, we we do it at church. It's not, uh, not for the sake of worship, yeah, but that for artistic reasons. But just uh, we we take pictures of our grandkids. So we we <laughs> we have pictures of uh, uh, we have pictures of our grandkids uh, on our, uh, or, and our kids on our phone. Is uh, I mean, uh, uh, that's you pick up your phone. There, uh, there's my there's my there's my children, my two granddaughters and Kimber. And so, um, but that, that, that's the things we do, but that are not things that we worship. Those are things that we love that God has given us and provides for us. Uh, when we look at the graven images, well, to give you a, a couple examples of God himself, as far as, uh, please don't, uh, try to get this turned around where, uh, you can make something out of it that it's not because you know, God himself, uh, for uh, for example, um, he told the Israelites to um, to take uh, and make um, brass uh, cherubims, two brass cherubims, to put uh, uh, on each side of the mercy seat. Uh, that's an, those are images, aren't they? Um, when the Israelites were one of their occasions when they were acting up on the same time, when he sent the poisonous snakes. Uh, and the and the poisonous snakes started biting and killing people, and then they once again, so many times they, they they repented, and God ordered that a that Moses would have a serpent made, a fiery serpent that was made out of brass, um, and that that serpent that the people would look at that serpent and repent that uh, they wouldn't die. And so, see, God has had images and things made over the years, but it's all about his glory. It's what everything is about. So when, when we look at that, we've got, we got to be careful. We cannot fixate ourselves. We, we have to keep that focus on what was said in the before me in the previous scripture. You've got to, be able, you've got to look forward. God only looks forward. If God did not look forward, We'd be in trouble as Christian schools. Why does he say about our sins? He doesn't look back. We pray forgiveness of our sins. But first of all, let's get back to when we accept his son, Jesus. What does God say? He says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgotten. Okay? And then we continue to sin, but we don't sin like we did before. There's... We don't. This is not the lesson, so we don't want to get into different sins in the different ways. We, we've had that before, and we'll end up doing it again, I'm sure. But God does not want some type of image, and that image, I mean, that image doesn't have to be a painting or a picture or a statue. Uh, it can be you, you know, you you buy you buy that new car or that new truck and it's sitting out in the driveway and you find yourself standing there at the window for days staring at your new vehicle. <laughs> I mean, it could be something that silly, okay? But that's, that's what we got to be careful about. Nothing comes before God because we have to realize that everything that you do have that is good is a result of God. Now, when I talk about everything that is good as far as a result of God, uh, we know that all Good things come from God. But you know something? You, you got to also keep in mind, there are times when things that don't seem good come from God. And that's what we have to think about. How many times are not? You just can't say all good things come from God. If something's not good or doesn't seem to seem to be good, it's got to be from the devil. No, no, no. That's not that's not it. All good things do come from God, but some things that seem to be not from God are from God. And how do we know that? Because when we trust him, we find out later that those things were from him and it was for whose good? Our good. You know that. Okay. Thou shalt not 
bow down thyself to them. Talking about the idols, okay? Nor serve them. And the idols could be a, car, a carved statue, which for that was that was the case back then. It was it was mainly statues. We've got so many other things in our repertoire now that we we don't have to have carved out statues and calves and you know and st- stuff like that. Okay, all right. Uh, that thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, big I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not bow them down themselves to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Um, Jealousy from God, the way we this this is some this scripture right here is worth the price of admission. Okay, uh, it really is. This scripture right here is so profitable for us right this minute. I am excited. I have waited all week just for this one right here. If I don't get any further, okay. Um, he is a jealous God, but is not a jealous God in the way we see jealousy today. He's not a jealous God of suspicion of envy, of, uh, of mistrust. That's not the jealousy that is in here when, from the original interpretation of the Hebrew. Okay? Zealous would probably be an even better word that we would use in our vocabulary today. This is a jealous God over his creation. <laughs> he is jealous over us. He is protective over us. Um, there was a um, British pastor and theologian, um, uh, Alan Redpath, and uh, he, he came to the United States, went uh, to Chicago to the Moody Institute and, uh, and preached there for years and taught there for years. And he, he summed up God's jealousy really simply. Uh, uh, ch- check this. Um, God is not jealous of us. He's just jealous for us. How's that? God is not jealous of us. He is jealous for us. He loves us. He's protective of us. He's like we are with our children. Look at it that way. You're zealous when it comes to your children or your grandchildren, particularly grandchildren. Uh, when we're, we're zealous, I am. Yeah, I mean it's like you know. I mean I'll I'll, I'll bristle up in a heartbeat uh, protection wise. I you know I I jump between them and anything that would harm them, and that's God for His people. He's right there between us and harm. And that's the zealous, jealous God that we serve. And that's a, that's a blessing is what that is. Now, here's the part that I want you to pay real close attention to, please. Uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and show a mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is a scripture that a lot of you, particularly the older people, and I don't know about the younger ones, uh, uh, how much they have heard this, but I think a lot of younger people have. Uh, a lot of people over the years have totally misrepresented this scripture when the part that says that visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children into the third and fourth gen- generation of them that hate that's not saying not saying that when a person commits a sin that if I commit a horrible sin and do not ask forgiveness for it and I do things not only do I commit a sin I commit I live a lifestyle and I commit sins and I do things that are absolutely horrible and then when I leave here that my children and that my children's children and children's children are going to suffer because of what I've done that is not, not what this means. What this means is God is saying here that when you disobey him and you live a lifestyle that is not becoming to him and his word, his will, and his way, what happens is, let's, let's just make examples, right? A child is raised in a family where the parents hate each other's guts and they're fighting all the time. There's a good possibility that child's going, if they get married, they'll do the same thing. 
uh, that a child is raised in a family where there's drugs every day. Every day it's drugs, drugs, drugs. What are the odds that that child's going to end up doing drugs? A child is raised in a family of an alcoholic or alcoholics. What are the odds that that child is going to turn out to be that same way? You see where the iniquity of the parents, the example that the parents is setting for the children can follow those children. And we know this, but that's what the context of this is. God is saying, you Israelites, you people, you, you Israelites, you, I don't know how, 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 how what do we call people from ash? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get tie tongued here, so I'm going to have to be careful. About but, you know, you Israelites, you people from Shalot, North Carolina, you people from Ash, North Carolina, you people from Calabash, you people, you know, you people, Ocean Isle, Sunset. Uh, you've got to listen to me. you got to do what I say. You've got to be good parents. You've got to be good people. You've got to raise your children in a right way. You have to instill upon your children the moral values, Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's what they are. Their moral values. You've got to instill, instill upon your children and impress upon your children these values that I'm laying out before you. Because if you don't, if you don't, this could follow, could follow for generations. You know, said it says, visiting the iniquity fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth of the generation of them that hate me. Because the children, if the parents hate God, and aren't doing the things to live a godly life, that means that them that hate me, he's talking about the children. Then the children will grow up being the same way as their parents. And unfortunately and sadly, we see that so much, don't we? We how many times have you have you said and other people say, Bless bless their heart. Yeah. Didn't have a chance to start with because that the house they were raised in turned out just the way his daddy did. He ain't a bit different than his daddy was. Hey, saving grace about everything in this book and showing mercy, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. See, that's not saying that first, that verse five is not saying that, that this is going to happen to all the children of people that do bad things. This is saying the ones that continue to hate God. Okay. The one that continue to hate God because he is showing mercy unto thousands. By, not, by this time, it would be millions of them that love him and keep his commandments. So the iniquity of the parrot does not transfer to the child. And if you want scripture on that, just see me and I'll give you a bunch of it. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there is lots and lots of scripture about that. When we look and what we do with our children, we look at the world that we're living in today and the things that we are doing in this world today, we have to look at these moral values. These moral values is what guides us. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote uh, several years ago in one of his books uh, about how it is, uh, it is born in us and instilled in us to be moral, that we, we automatically inherently know the difference between right and wrong, that it's wrong to kill or murder, it's wrong to murder, it is wrong to steal, it is wrong to do pe other people uh, in a way that uh, they, they should they just shouldn't be done. He wrote that several years ago. I'm sitting here right now thinking about what he wrote, what I totally believe everything in the Bible and we look at where we are today. That the devil has got a hold of that built in what should be a sense of right and wrong. And it's really gotten a hold of a lot of people in this world, hasn't it? When we look at what's going on in our country right now, oh yeah, everybody's thinking right now, here he goes. Yeah, here I go. Some people think that I'm just trying to be political and, and use my Sunday school class to be political. I'm not being political. I'm just doing what the Bible says. And people that say, "Don't you, know, you don't go there and you don't you don't mix politics and religion." Not mixing politics and religion is what God us where we are right now as Christians. You're not going to show me the Bible 
that you don't you don't do that as a Christian. I will show you. You want to talk New Testament? I'll show you in the New Testament. If you don't want me to talk about the Old Testament, I'll show you in the New Testament as much as you more than you want to see of where we are to stand up for our God given rights and God Himself. Do you think? Do you think our Father? Do you think Jesus is happy with what's going on in the greatest country on earth right this very minute? When people, half of this country is out rioting, killing innocent people, uh, killing killing uh, men's of God. A, a, a pastor was killed or murdered. For Pete's sake, I mean, a pastor was murdered and it hardly got coverage uh, in, in the media. Uh, morals. Is this moral what's being done? The morality of the United States right this minute is what I think at an all-time low. You could say it's the morality of biblical proportions when you look at the things that has happened throughout the years. I mean, the Bible is full of horrible things. Just think of the way the Israelites were treated by uh, Pharaoh in Egypt before God delivered them out of here in this Sunday school lesson and all the other bad things that have happened. But look where we are right now. That's because of good people being quiet, good people sitting on the sidelines and not praying like they should and not being open like they should. You know, when you, some people say, well, I go to church and I pray that our country gets healed. I'm not going to say praying is not enough because that would be wrong to say. But you know, if, if you're praying like you should, you're also going to realize that you've got to get out and you've got to open your mouth. If you don't get out and take a stand for Jesus Christ right this very minute and the morals that, that they had right here at Mount, the foot of Mount Sinai, and we're right there now. If you don't stand, take a stand openly for Jesus Christ, you're a, clo you're a closet Christian, and that's not going to cut it because we're on the verge of being able to lose our rights in this country. Churches are already being penalized. Uh, just seeing how churches were one of the first things on the list well, with the COVID crisis, how churches are being treated. You know, anarchy, socialism, is religion for these people. My religion is called Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And can I just, hey, they don't let me do this again. That's okay. I'm getting to get this one out. And I, I think Brian will do it for me. Uh, and he said, no, they're agreeing at me. So it's simple. And I'm going to stop right here when it comes to what's going on in our country right now. But ask yourself something on whichever side of the political aisle you're on. Just one question is all I have for you right now. Do you believe in murdering innocent children in the womb? Do you believe that it's okay to murder innocent children in the womb? If you do, you're a good Democrat. And I won't say nothing else. And that's because that's my number one issue. That is my number one issue. You either protect life or you're, you're able and willing to let others protect us. David said in Psalm 16, 1 through 4, preserve me, O God. And that's what I want to preserve us. For in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellence in whom in all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Preserve me, O God, for thee I do put my trust. Do you trust God? Do you trust his word? Do you believe his word? There's where we're at right now. We've got half the country does not believe his word and they do not trust God. So you got to ask yourself, if you believe God's word, how much of it do you believe? Are you a picker and chooser? 
If it makes you feel good, is it okay? If you don't like what it says, do you skip over that part real quick and move on to something or try to find something to fit your narrative? You don't have to try to fit. You're not going to find some things that will fit your narrative. They're not here. Okay? There's only one narrative, and that's the narrative of Jesus Christ. So David is saying, preserve me. What does preserve me? Take care of me. Look after me. Look after me. Take care of me, O oh God, for in thee I do put my trust. We've got to trust God. That's, that's the most important thing. His soul said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness, extendeth not to me. Yet my goodness extendeth not to, not to thee. What is he saying? He's saying that I have no goodness. David is, t- David is telling God, Slow down, Don. David is telling God, I have no goodness apart from thee. That's what he's saying. I, I, Don Stanley, sitting right here, guy sitting in front of me, we have no goodness. It's all God's goodness. Uh, If we take God, if we take God away from us and we think we're going to survive and we're going to spend eternity based on our goodness, Oh boy, you're in trouble right now if you believe that. Okay? It's all God's goodness. And we have nothing good about us. It's God's goodness. Totally. The saints that are in the earth and to the excellence to whom old life. He, he returned the earth. You know, you got remember the Old Testament, the grave, Sheol was 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 considered um uh, was considered hell is what it amounted to. Their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Another God. Okay, another God's what they're looking at. We have this country is using secular things as their God. There is only one true God. You cannot, you cannot make government your your God. And that is happening. And when government becomes God, God will still rule supreme. You can bet on that, but the country will fail. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. The grave is no testament. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's important right there. Let me read that again for you. Pay attention. Um, David saying, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in the grave. He knows he's going to be resurrected. Now, this is Old Testament. This is cool, all right? Neither wilt thou suffer thy thine holy one to see corruption. He's talking about the who's the holy one? Jesus. And the resurrection is what David is talking about right here. Yeah, Jesus, the holy one to see corruption. What did he do on the third day? He arose. That's what happened. So if you believe in the true living God and Jesus, he arose on the third day, and David saw it right here in the Old Testament. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence, in fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's beautiful. David had a way. He had a way. A man after God's own heart. But yet he wasn't perfect either, was he? Oh, he was not perfect. But if we fashion ourselves in the way that we should after God, we can see that a person that God loved so much in David, but yet he still sinned against God. That's why we do. We're not perfect either. But we are being perfected through our salvation by accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And the day will come when that path of perfection that we're climbing up that wall and walking down will unite with Jesus. And then we will have fulfilled our perfection with Jesus Christ. And that day will come. It's uh, the pastor Wednesday night um, just kind of blew me away with the Bible study. He was talking about the Old Testament. And for a minute there, I thought he was going to do my Sunday school lesson. It scared me. Uh, it's uh, it's been it's been a quite a week. Uh, the pastor and I both lost a very dear friend this uh, this week, but uh, 
Jerry Barnes. And uh, I just pray for his family and, and all the others that are suffering and hurting at this time. So I just pray that you would uh, please keep uh, Jerry's family and his wife, Joyce, uh, in your prayers. Uh, uh, he was he was a good man. And at the funeral, uh, as the pastor said, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Carlton King said the same thing. Everyone that knew Jerry, that he was a moral, good person. And I thought it was a blessing was meant for him. Father, we love you. We thank you for everything that you do. As in our weak capabilities, we do. And Father, we love you. And we pray that you will just continue to strengthen us so that we take our years and put them to use for you. Uh, I look at the mirror. And I see no hair where there used to be hair. I see gray-white hair where there used to be brown hair. And but Father, what I see most of all as I age is be one step closer to you in glory. So Father, thank you for seeing your son Jesus for us. We've, we're, we've, we've been given a clear choice. They talk about election time. It's a clear choice. Well, I'm not worried about the election. You are in control. You always have been. I pray to you for your outcome to be one that that your people will flourish. But if your will is that it be different right now, we will survive through faith in your son Jesus. So Father, I just pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it is in the name of the whole angels, your son Jesus, I humbly pray. Amen.